the advocate for the for the peer movement uh, in this country. I'm excited and honored to welcome you to our webinar today titled Financing Peer Recovery Support Opportunities to Enhance the Substance Use Disorder Peer Workforce. Um, during today's webinar, we'll review the overarching findings from a recent SAMHSA report that's on um, the SAMHSA website, which I'll go over in a minute. Um, and we'll also have a, a, a group of panel members um, experts that are going to provide their own perspectives on the evolving role of peers in the substance abuse um, disorders treatment workforce. Um, I am super excited to say that we had uh, 1,300 people, more than 1,300 people register for today's event. And um, if you look at the participants counter, it's going up, up, up as, as I'm even talking here. And um, to be honest, I kind of feel like it's Tom Coderre because he like brings in the crowds and he always is so popular and I have to admit I'm a fan also. So that's part of it, but it's because of the topic. I mean, this is a really important topic to people and I'm so glad that you all, um, you know, prioritize coming here today. I know that people are busy and we appreciate um, you taking the time. A few housekeeping items before we get started here. Um, First, you'll be noticing that we, for today's event, we have two American Sign Language interpreters on the call. Uh, we have Amy Kosmar and Dorothy uh, Radebaugh, who will be joining us for today's presentation. They are pinned on your screen so you can, um, you can, uh, you can see them. <laughs> and then um, today's webinar is recorded. The recording, along with the slides and the special report that's out today, um, they will be posted, um, if we can go to the next slide, Emma, they'll be posted on the CFRI website, which is uh, www.samsa.gov forward slash CFRI, C-F-R-I. Um, we'll be posting those within 10 days. The recording will be posted there in 10 days, as will the slides. We'll email them to you as well. So you'll know uh, when they're ready for you there. I'd like to draw your attention to two additional features on this webinar console. So there's a Q&A widget. The Q&A widget is where you want to type your questions to your speakers. When you, uh, many of you actually submitted really thoughtful questions when you registered for this event. And I want to assure you that your questions were shared with our speakers today, and you'll probably hear the answers to them, to your questions as part of the presentation. Um, if you don't hear the answer to your question, please go ahead and type it into the Q&A. And as a matter of fact, we have people working behind the scenes and we'll be answering those questions in real time if we can. And some of those questions will be held to the Q&A session, which will be at the end of, uh, after, after, we get to after we listen to the panel. If you're having any technical difficulties, um, please go ahead and use the Q&A or you can use the chat feature. Um, the chat feature is there for you. We are also, our team is monitoring the chat feature as well. So you can ask your questions in there. We prefer the Q&A so you can see what other people are asking and see the answers in there. But you can use the chat and the chat is also of course there for you to speak to one another um, during the presentation as you wish. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about where this webinar fits within the overall Center for Financing Reform and Innovation Task Order, the CFRI Task Order. So CFRI is a SAMHSA contract. Uh, we at Westat are the prime contractors. Uh, Westat is a employee owned company headquartered in Rockville, Maryland. CFRI is one of my actual favorite contracts projects that I've ever worked on because we do such fun things related to mental health, substance abuse, prevention, treatment, and financing. Um, you can find out everything you wanna know about CFRI if you go visit our website. I, I mentioned it before, but it's www.samhsa.gov forward slash CFRI. There you'll be able to see our other webinars, recording of those webinars, slides, and reports. And you'll be able to see the report that we are featuring today during our webinar. Um, so during the webinar today, we will have, we are pleased to have 
Greg Williams, who is the president of Third Horizons, um, present about our report, and he'll also be moderating the webinar. I'll let him introduce himself in a few minutes. But before we get there, I'd like um, to introduce Tom Coderre, who will give us um, some opening remarks from SAMHSA. Tom is uh, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary at SAMHSA. He has decades of experience in public, private, and nonprofit services. Tom is the first person in recovery to lead SAMHSA, and I'm so pleased that he's able to provide some opening remarks today. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Tom. Well, thank you so much, Shoma. I'm really humbled by your introduction and your comments earlier, and proud to be able to join uh, you all today for this webinar. Uh, we're really excited to discuss some of the great work SAMHSA is doing through our Center for Finance and Reform and Innovation, or what we call CFRI. Uh, we have lots of projects underway, um, uh, as well as some that we have already released in the past several months. Um, here are a few uh, topics uh, that we have released reports on and done webinars about. Coordinated specialty care for first episode psychosis, costs and financing strategies, exploring value-based payment for substance use disorder um, services in the United States, Medicaid coverage for medications to reverse opioid overdose and treat alcohol and opioid use disorders. And finally, examining the use of braided funding for substance use disorder services, which we released just a few weeks ago. And it had a similar fanfare as to today's report. Another report uh, we'd like to highlight is, as it's gonna complement today's topic is the Medicaid reimbursement for peer support services in the United States. That was developed in partnership with the Peer Recovery Center of Excellence. And this report is gonna provide a comprehensive national overview of states, district and territories that offer Medicaid reimbursement for peer recovery support services. The report includes state specific reimbursement rates, processes and procedures. It sheds light on the mechanisms that enable the integration of peer support services in the United States Medicaid system. It's going to be an excellent adjunct to the report we're discussing today, and I encourage you to check it out once it's published. Uh, to learn more about uh, any of these uh, reports that I mentioned in any upcoming projects, uh, please visit SAMHSA's CFRI webpage. Uh, the peer support workforce, as you guys already know, and I'm so impressed to see over 500 people on this webinar. Um, that workforce is clearly crucial to creating a more robust behavioral health workforce. But this issue is something um, that I'm super passionate about as well, because as some of you know, I went through a vicious battle with alcohol and other drugs personally. And as my addiction progressed, I started to lose the things that were most important to me. When my family and friends tried to help, I resisted their help, I pushed them away. That caused me to lose them. I lost interest in politics. I lost my job and my position as a state senator. I lost my spirit. I lost my freedom. In the end, I lost everything, even my desire to live. My life, which at one time was so full of hope, became hopeless. Fortunately, I was able to get the help that I needed. And today, I'm a person in long-term recovery, which for me means I haven't used alcohol or drugs uh, in almost 21 years, since May 15th of 2003. Uh, and as I started this journey, one of the most important things that I encountered was the support of other people who had been on this journey before me. So for me personally, peer support um, wasn't just important, it was essential for my recovery. Peer support taught me that I was not alone. Peer support taught me that treatment is effective and that people can and do recover. Peer support gave me hope, community, a belief in today uh, and faith in tomorrow. And peer support also provided this resilient and robust infrastructure of people and places. Uh, it also provided a loving but rigorous cohort of reinforcers, people who understood the pitfalls, the daily struggles, the doubts, the uncertainties, and the rationalizations, and who, passing no judgment, did not waver in pointing the way forward for me. Uh, so as you can see, 
uh, I really believe in peers. Uh, peers saved my life. And I know they saved many of the other folks' lives who are on this call today. And so for us to be able to figure out how to integrate uh, peers into more work, how to get uh, them paid for, how to, how to create career pathways for these folks, how to use the peer workforce to really help us solve uh, some of the workforce shortages we're having in our field. That's what we're all about. That's what we're trying to do. That's why we're so engaged in this work. That's why this uh, topic is also important to SAMHSA. Peer support recovery services, as you know, are social support services that are delivered by people who have lived experience with substance use disorders and mental health conditions. And there's a growing understanding of the evidence base supporting the benefits of peer recovery support services, thank God. Um, this work aligns with SAMHSA's mission for behavioral health treatment, supporting better outcomes for the people we serve. And we hope that the report and the panel discussion today uh, will give you some ideas for overcoming the challenges to growing the peer recovery support services workforce. Together, we're gonna be able to advance the types of innovative solutions to improve the quality and the effectiveness of substance use disorder treatment and recovery services nationwide. I wanna thank today's speakers and panelists, Greg, Liz, Sierra, and Kristen, all people who I've had an opportunity to work with over the years and respect a great deal. Uh, their time and expertise today is appreciated. I also wanna thank my colleague, Eric Lolo uh, from uh, SAMHSA's uh, Center for Mental Health Services, who has been the lead on this project, as well as Trina Dutta for her overall work in bringing back CFRI and advancing the many important projects that I outlined earlier. Finally, I'd like to give a special thanks to the Westat team for the work they do on CFRI and for putting this webinar together today. I'm so thrilled to see so many of you have joined us today. Thank you all for making time to learn more about this important topic. Back to you, Shoma. Thank you so much, Tom. Like, ugh. This is why we're all fans. You're amazing. Like, I feel like we should all be clapping right now. And we would be if we were all in all together. But thank you so much for those remarks. That was that was wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I would like to um, move us along to our presentation from Get Greg Williams. Um, Greg, I'll let you introduce yourself in a moment. Um, Greg has a decade of experience working with nonprofit and government agencies on improving addiction services and supports. And he's dedicated his life towards making a positive change in terms of providing access to quality health care, recovery supports, and for helping over 40 million Americans with substance use disorders. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Greg. Thank you, Shoma. Um, and thank you, Tom. It's, uh, it's a pre uh, privilege to be here. I'm really excited um, for the topic and, and I'll move through uh, some of our slides quickly today uh, so we can get to the experts on the on the panel. But um, uh, so I am also a person in, in long-term recovery. And so it's uh, uh, extraordinary extraordinarily special for me to have an opportunity to work on this particular project. Um, uh, our organization, Third Horizon Strategies, is a, a partner to Westat on, on this work, and we've had an opportunity to uh, bring together an expert panel, do research uh, in both Medicaid and grant funding of, of peer recovery support services, dig into the history of uh, how we've supported, innovated, and created some of these um, peer recovery support systems that we have. Um, and so the report that is available now kind of digs into some of those issues, but goes further than that and provides some concrete action steps uh, recommended by experts outside of SAMHSA. So these the, the, the uh, report includes some recommendations um, that I think are really important for us to highlight and we'll talk about it as part of the panel. Um, and uh, so let me just take a, a few minutes to fly over that, and then we'll we'll dig into some 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 of the topics in more depth uh, with our experts. Um, so if we go to the next slide, just to to level set, and and I think Shoma and, and Tom already articulated this really well. Uh, but our definition that we use in the report is uh, peer recovery support services, uh, PRSS, as as the acronym, are social supports delivered by peer recovery specialists. Um, and we and we talked a little bit about. Uh, people with lived experience, but it's really important to think about what they do 
uh, which is uh, provide linkages, connection, support uh, in a non-clinical set of activities. Um, so outside of the professional skill sets of counselors or clinicians um, or psychiatrists, uh, but serve a different functional role in, in the ecosystem to respond to substance use uh, disorders. If we can go to the next slide. So some of the benefits that, that we found uh, in our research from the literature that we did, um, increased sense of social support, housing, uh, relationships, uh, some of the things that Tom highlighted, reduction of, of use of substances, hospitalizations, uh, reduced recurrences of, of substance use disorders. Myself, uh, haven't had to, to use alcohol or other drugs uh, since July 15th, 2001. Um, and a lot of that uh, lack of reoccurrence of my substance use disorder, I can credit to um, uh, good peer support. So if we can keep moving. Um, this is, I, I love history. And so, so thinking about the history of this, this is, you know, one of the few areas where you really look at history and, and the federal government was the innovator in, in, in what we know of as organized peer recovery support services. And so that dated back primarily with, with the advent of uh, the Recovery Community Support Program in 1998. Um, and there's some great history out there if, if you're interested, cited in our report from William White and, and SAMHSA and some others who, who um, uh, have documented that, that rich history. Uh, but then in 2004, uh, access to recovery uh, built upon that and, and really started to fund certain states um, in, a, in a voucher kind of way. And, and that's the first time we really saw um, transactional or encounter-based uh, peer recovery funded in, in that kind of context. Um, in 2007, CMS released their first guidance that allowed for uh, peer recovery supports to be uh, reimbursed uh, if delivered by a mental health professional. So there was this letter that was issued that we highlight. Um, and then um, in 2007, uh, I'm sorry, um, there was another letter issued uh, in 2013, but SAMHSA started allowing um, peer recovery to be reimbursed within the, the Substance Abuse Prevention Treatment Block Grant, now called the Substance Use Prevention and Treatment and Recovery Services Block Grant. Uh, so we've since renamed the block grant to include recovery, and that was a big change that we saw last year. Um, and certainly the, the state opioid response grants. And uh, uh, as was mentioned by Tom, the, there, there is a peer recovery center of excellence now um, that SAMHSA funds. If we can go to the next slide. Um, and so we did review uh, how these services were financed through grants, um, through different federal agencies, um, and, and lots of the grants uh, allowed to define the roles of, of peers, but most of the grantees got to uh, propose the activities and services uh, different. Um, and so the flexibility created a lot of variation through the grant history that, that I just went through of the role and the payment rates. And it was hard to necessarily create um, uh, a, a strong baseline for, for what the payment rates were for peer recovery. If we can go to the next slide. Um, in Medicaid, there's a few different functional ways that, that uh, peers are reimbursed. Uh, I won't read this list, but uh, whether, whether or not which mechanism in Medicaid, um, but we identified reimbursement rates in Medicaid across all 50 states. Um, and it's important to, to understand the findings that I'll, I'll go through around utilization and, and rates. Um, it's not inclusive of the community-based peer recovery supports that are operated in uh, perhaps through nonprofits, through recovery community organizations, or funded through grants. These, what, what I'll show you next is really just what's being reimbursed through Medicaid, uh, which is part of the story and part of our discussion in, in a few minutes. We can go to the next slide. Um, so, so I won't spend a lot of time here, but, but we do highlight the different certification requirements, uh, the different numbers of hours and the different uh, training and supervision components. Um, uh, the Peer Center of, of Excellence also has a uh, tool that, that is worth visiting that gets updated over time. We did a lot of this work last year, uh, so their, your state might not have the exact um, uh, criteria if it, if it changed in the last 12 months. We can go to the next slide. What we found from reimbursement, there was a wide range of reimbursement rates, uh, everywhere from almost $6 to $27. 
Uh, so we have a grid in the back of the report that shows you reimbursement rates by state. You can look up your, your reimbursement rate. And this is all on the basis of a 15 minute increment, uh, a CPT code called H0038. And that is the reimbursement code that we saw had the, the maximum usage across the state, almost every state, I think, except for one or two, is reimbursing for H0038. So it allowed us to really look across states um, and provide find some fidelity uh, to, to look at this. Of note, 11 states allow senior peers to be supervisors. So um, the different states have interpreted CMS guidance different ways. Um, in some states, they, they only allow clinical supervision. In other states, they allow peers to supervise. Um, 30 states uh, didn't allow peers to supervise other peers. So that's really important. And, and we heard from the experts is a, is an, is a potential roadblock to, to scaling other peer services. We can go to the next slide. And so when we think about peer services in Medicaid, while the benefit is, is pretty uh, ubiquitous across the states, um, we are not seeing the same adoption of uh, peer recovery support services in the Medicaid program, the way that we uh, see clinical services growing during the same period or being utilized in the Medicaid system um, whatsoever. And so we were able to analyze uh, utilization data that, that the Center for Medicaid Services publishes. And this is 2017 to 2020. Uh, this shows you a trend line. And the bottom line, almost the flat line at the bottom, 32,000 to 84,000 encounters is all that exists in, in that data from that period uh, for utilization in Medicaid, where in contrast, you see uh, things like emergency services, inpatient care, um, counseling, medications for OUD, all of these other covered Medicaid services are, are like exorbitantly higher in terms of its utilization uh, in the Medicaid program and what the Medicaid program is purchasing in communities. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And so we brought together a panel uh, to kind of uh, ask about uh, the challenges of increasing the availability of workforce. And, and, and because there seems to be such demand for peer recovery ser services, and there's this financing mechanism that, that potentially could uh, be expanded, what, what are the reasons why this uh, particular um, uh, Medicaid portal isn't being used uh, as, as robustly as potentially it could? Um, and so one of those core elements is, is matching the nature of the service to a 15 minute billable increment. Um, the inconsistence financing, low compensation, lack of clear guidance on the role and support of, of peers. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that um, coming up. The uh, uh, unified federal guidance. So, so, so a lot of peer recovery organizations or peer recovery uh, providers have relationships with different federal agencies, um, and, and they get different guidance or different requirements from uh, the different agencies um, or state agencies. And, uh, and how do we increase salaries for peer workers was, was a core concern. If we go to my last slide before jumping into the panel, um, <coughs> we um, so while the prevalence and utilization of, of peer recovery support services has increased in recent years in Medicaid, um, the variation and in inconsistency in financing are inhibiting the growth of the profession. Um, the ongoing overdose crisis research on the value of effectiveness of peer recovery supports, uh, the prevalence of individuals living in recovery, all provide a significant opportunity to increase the utilization of peer recovery as an adjunct to, to existing community responses to alcohol and other drugs. Um, and then further efforts in, in new and updated guidance from the federal and state stakeholders could help support and expand the peer uh, workforce. So the, the experts concluded on a couple areas of that guidance um, that are included in this report. Uh, so with that, I'm going to transition to have a discussion with, with our experts. And, and I'm pleased to be uh, joined by uh, Sierra Castado de, de Martel, who's a postdoctoral research fellow at Chestnut Health Systems Lighthouse Institute. Uh, Kristen Harper, uh, a public health advisor uh, at SAMHSA's Office of Recovery, um, and Elizabeth Burden, a senior advisor at the National Council for Mental Wellbeing, all three who've, who've done extensive uh, work um, around peer recovery support services and looking at them 
in in very different ways. Um, and so let me let me start with uh, Sierra. Um, so you you spent a considerable amount of time researching and thinking about the value of peer recovery uh, for substance use disorder in a very a, a variety of health and social systems. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the focus of your work and what types of benefits our communities can derive from peer recovery support services? Absolutely. Thanks so much. Um, I'll just introduce myself briefly. I'm Sierra Castedo de Martel. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at Chestnut Health Systems Lighthouse Institute, and I do focus on economic evaluations of peer-driven substance use interventions like PRSS, and I also do research on the peer workforce itself. Um, but most importantly, I'm a person in long-term recovery, and peer recovery support was a huge part of my, my own story. Um, so my work is focused mainly on, on cost effectiveness of different recovery support services, including PRSS, um, which was a more recent study. So methods like cost effectiveness, they tell us about the balance between the resources that go into an intervention or a kind of service, and then the good stuff that comes out. How balanced are those two parts of the equation? And one of the things that we looked at in our analysis of PRSS was just the number of people who would be in recovery at three years after engaging in PRSS compared to if they went to specialty substance use disorder treatment alone. Um, and we found that about 40% more people would be in recovery. Um, and if we apply that to the whole US treatment population, that means 300,000 more people in recovery than treatment alone. And we picked three years because that's when um, the risk of returning to chaotic use kind of stabilizes. We also found that for every thousand people who get long-term PRSS in addition to specialty treatment, we're saving over $1.7 million in societal costs and almost $200,000 in medical costs that are averted. And that's compared again to specialty treatment. Treatment is effective, but in concert with long-term PRSS, it's even more so. And that's not even factoring in what we know really happens. We know that most people in any given year don't get any kind of treatment. Uh, we know that sometimes PRSS might, might help somebody get into treatment, or it might help them bypass treatment entirely. That was the case for my own story. So the real cost savings are probably even higher than that. Uh, but we wanted to be kind of really strict in this analysis to make sure that nobody accused us of painting an overly rosy picture of PRSS. Um, so even when we're comparing PRSS to this best case scenario, this strictest application, it's still really efficient in comparison. And PRSS are cost effective, um, even under a wide variety of circumstances. When we change a lot of the inputs, if we um, raise peer worker pay, for example, um, or if we model that we're serving fewer people or more people, it's still very cost effective. Uh, we actually developed a cost effectiveness calculator for peer recovery support services along with that analysis. Um, it's free, it's online, you can use it. Um, from some of the organizations that have used our calculator, we actually see that under some circumstances, it's not just cost effective, it's also cost saving. So analyses like these are important. Um, they are important because they can help decision makers see um, where those savings are happening um, and, and that it actually makes economic sense because decision makers aren't necessarily seeing cost savings from PRSS show up as a budget, a line item, right? We have to put together these kinds of analyses and share those results with them in order for them to kind of see those larger, those larger savings. And when we save money all across the system, that means that we can spread those dollars to actually help more people, right? So that's why it matters. Anyway, the bottom line is that peer recovery support services work and they work very cost effectively. Thanks. Thanks, Sierra. And, and the work is, is phenomenal. I know some folks uh, would love to, to, to play with the calculator if you can drop that in the chat for, for them. Um, and, and, and so Kristen, I, we're so thrilled to have you in the Office of Recovery. And it's been thrilling to watch uh, the Office of Recovery kind of come in and fill some, some gaping holes for all of us where you know, for those of us who who know folks in different states, and there's 500 plus people here from all over the world, um, the way that that 
peer recovery support is uh, defined often is dictated by the boundaries of the state. And so can you talk a, li a little bit about the effort um, in the driving force behind building some national model standards, the first ever standards uh, for mental health and substance use uh, peer recovery supports? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Greg. And first of all, I just want to say hello to everyone out there and introduce myself briefly. Uh, Kristen Harper, I'm a public health advisor at the Office of Recovery, as Greg mentioned, at SAMHSA, and also uh, have lived experience with mental health and substance use conditions, and am a product of peer recovery support services, so this topic is near and dear. Actually, today, literally, is my one-year anniversary of joining the Office of Recovery, so this is a really great way to celebrate. Uh, when I came aboard last year, my colleague David Awadala was really busy with developing the model standards, and He's been such a support in helping kind of catch me up on what the internal process looks like. But coming from the peer support world and the community, I could immediately tell that it was a community-driven effort. And I'm really uh, happy and grateful that SAMHSA prioritized having people with lived experience at every part of the decision-making process um, in the development of the national standards. So just briefly, why the standards were developed, um, not to get too much into, into policy or, or, you know, which administration wanted to do what, but President Biden did announce his unity agenda in March of, of 2022. And part of that was uh, to include the development and implementation of a national certification program for mental health peer specialists. And to meet that goal, SAMHSA collaborated with federal, state, tribal, territorial, and local partners, including peer recovery support specialists and those who train and certify us uh, to develop the national model standards for peer support certification. And since the initial 2015 release of the SAMHSA core competencies for peer workers in the behavioral health space, the peer workforce has just flourished. And it's resulted in implementation of state endorsed or state run peer certification programs across 48 out of 50 states. And the national model standards are designed to accelerate this universal adoption, recognition, and integration of the peer workforce and to strengthen the foundation set up by the peer workforce. I'm so glad that was mentioned in the chat that this truly did come from a grassroots movement. SAMHSA acknowledges the nuances, however, across the peer workforce in the community being served as states often reflect the needs that are unique to their community. So it's very tricky, right, in trying to develop sort of this uh, unifying set of standards or boundaries when each state has very specific needs. And so what we try to do with the development of the standards, they're not intended as a substitute for any state certification per se, but instead have been developed as guidance for states territories and tribes, and others to promote quality and encourage uh, alignment and reciprocity across often disparate state peer service systems. So basically it boils down to eight major focus areas uh, and how these standards benefit the peer workforce. One is to increase reciprocity, two, to promote quality, three, to protect authenticity, four, support state certification entities, and five, cultivate peer workforce. Six, reinforce the scope, and seven, strengthen diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and eight, expand career pathways. And I'm sure that we'll go into more detail on the specific 11 standards that are listed in the model standard document later in this session. So I, I'll hold off, but I will say that the process that started in fall 2022 that the OR led really um, was uh, quite comprehensive. It, it ranged from um, doing uh, an incredible um, sort of revamping of uh, an updated comparative analysis of state requirements for peer support service training and certification uh, with the Peer Center of Excellence to convening a diverse set of technical experts with a wide range of identities, lived experiences, and professional expertise to help develop the framework for the standards and then also use the uh, findings from the technical expert panel, the comparative analysis and other resources before opening it up for public comment. And thank you to those of you who were able to give your comments, which were included and incorporated in the final document, which was published last year. So I will turn it back over to you, Greg, and look forward to answering any questions anyone has. Yeah, th thank you, Kristen. It's uh, very, it was, it was, it's very exciting to have it out there, and and I think this this issue of employment and employing peers is at the core of what people are wanting to know about in the chat, and and it's at the core of 
uh, lots of conversations around expanding the workforce. And, and so Liz, you, you spent decades uh, helping recovery community organizations specifically um, develop peer recovery support services in their programming um, to respond to substance use disorders. What, what are some of the opportunities and challenges that, that you think uh, we face in terms of employment of peers or expanding the workforce? Uh, thanks, Greg. I'll, as others will introduce myself. Hi, I'm Liz Burden. I'm a senior advisor with the National Council for Mental Wellbeing. I'm not a person in recovery, but I'm a long-term ally and have been honored and privileged to work with recovery communities, uh, community health workers, uh, harm reductionists across the now almost four decades of, of my uh, career in public service. So thanks for this opportunity. Uh, and I definitely can share what I've learned from recovery uh, community organizations and what I've observed in those and other uh, peer settings. I think there are three key opportunities um, in using Medicaid funding for peer support services. And I think there are also three key challenges and I'll try and get them all in pretty quickly. Um, the first opportunity I think is in addition to treatment and system outcomes that are really documented in page four of the report, um, we can also achieve recovery outcomes. There's an opportunity for that, which are, are longer term and different from those outcomes for systems and organizations. They include things like increased hope, increased empowerment, increased health seeking, uh, increased social connectedness, improved physical, psychological, and emotional health, uh, self-efficacy, self-determination, autonomy, sense of belonging. All of those are important as well and are, are measures that uh, researchers like Sierra are helping us to quantify in ways uh, that make sense and that can help others understand them. I also think that there's an opportunity for more recovery and more um, settings, including other healthcare settings that are offering both peer supports and peer services. And there is a difference between the two that we probably won't get a chance to talk about today, but both are important in the mix of services that are being offered. Um, uh, third opportunity I think uh, is for blended enhanced models of peer services in that we're seeing innovations around different um, threads or themes or traditions, if you will, of peer support coming together in ways uh, that are operating in uh, clinical settings, but they're also operating in autonomous peer spaces that are part of larger non-peer organizations. Well, we see peer-run organizations that are beginning to offer clinical services. You know, there's just a lot of um, blending enhanced models that are out there that Medicaid funding may help to support. And finally, I hope, I'm hoping that um, using this kind of funding can help build capacity of RCOs and other peer-run organizations that developed and that continue to develop, nurture, and innovate the supports and services that we're talking about here um, and not just other kinds of healthcare organizations. And hopefully we'll talk more about building capacity uh, later as we talk about the can uh, uh, later in the panel. Uh, the challenges that I see are, are several, and I'll try and cover them in a couple of minutes. One is continuing to state and restate, clarify and re-clarify what peer work is. Um, understanding that peer workers are not paraprofessionals. You know, paraprofessionals uh, assist other professionals, but peers are there to assist the individual within the organizational context. Um, the peers are not junior fill in the blanks who are delegated social work or clinical case management tasks. Instead, they have their own unique set of knowledge and skills and tasks. Um, being trained to support someone on their recovery journey. Um, and so we need to design, make sure we're designing peer jobs that are being paid for, that are being funded, not to lighten the loads of other staff, but instead to really do true peer support. Um, we need to be uh, concerned about dispersion uh, or watering down of peer support. And that's a corollary to what I just said. Um, uh, and make sure we're understanding what the research really, foundational research really tells us about what peer support is and what it isn't, um, uh, and the difference between peer support and peer services um, as well. Um, supervision is always one that's important to talk about and was talked about in the report, and that's a challenge to continue to find individuals who are qualified to supervise peer support, and that's different than um, other kinds of supervision, other tasks. Career paths, lattices, and portfolios, hopefully that's a challenge that hopefully Medicaid funding will help organizations to look at. Organizational readiness to integrate peer recovery supports and services is always a challenge and Medicaid funding may bring other people to the table to provide and offer peer supports and we need to make, wanna make sure that they're ready to actually integrate those supports into the programs. 
And lastly, 20 seconds, um, co-optation as settings for peer work diversifying, there always is a pull or shift away from models in which peer supporters uh, and true peer support happens. And so we really need to help um, organizations that may be using Medicaid funding to really understand what authentic, genuine peer support really is so we don't squeeze the juice out of it because of the funding. I think I got it all in five minutes. <laughs> You did, you did great, and, and you, you covered almost uh, a whole line of questioning I had, so, so it, you, you helped it advance us quite far. I, one of the things that, that I was excited to um, think about with this work, uh, you know, our organization uh, runs something called the Alliance for Addiction Payment Reform, and we think about, you know, just because something was paid for one way historically doesn't necessarily mean that it always has to be paid for that way. And, and uh, one of the things that I try to impress uh, around peer run organizations or uh, RCOs um, in different ways is, you know, to look at Medicaid and look at the creative financing strategies that other sectors of our healthcare and social systems have deployed, whether that be in schools or housing situations or the criminal justice system. Um, we're using Medicaid really creatively in certain ways, but our communities have yet to, to necessarily uh, see that. And, and there are ways to think about um, your state and your community to, to have alternative uh, payment models that aren't a 15-minute increment, and that might go to the heart at some of the, the um, pathways that, that Liz said, is how can you utilize this funding but, but make it work for the service and, and make it um, stay congruent with the service. And so um, in the interest of time and wanting to get to uh, so many great questions in, in our uh, Q and A here. I'll just ask each one of you, um, uh, you know, as you reflected on Chapter Four of the report and some of the recommendations from the expert panel um, of different things that the federal government could do. Uh, you know, whether that be Department of Labor or o Office of National Drug C Control Policy or the Healthcare Resource Services Administration, Center for for Medicaid Services, and certainly SAMHSA. Uh, what are what are some of the recommendations that popped out to you that that you think could really help benefit expanding the workforce uh, uh, and scaling this service in communities? And and maybe I'll I'll uh, I'll start with Kristen and then go to Sierra and and finish with Liz. Yeah, so you're gonna start with the Fed to tell Feds what they need to do better. So I appreciate that, Greg. Um, so I you know prior to being a bureaucrat, I actually was an executive director for a, a recovery community organization in North Carolina that was a statewide. And the one recommendation in chapter four that really resonated with me based on that particular experience was the infrastructure and um, technology uh, is minimal and we need to real, really focus on some capacity building around there. And I'll say that we were really fortunate at that time to have, we were one of the first uh, states that got block grant funds. Um, and so our recovery community organization has supplemental block grant dollars that kind of helped with some of the infrastructure needs. So hiring a bookkeeper and looking into doing billing. And we also were an ATR access to recovery grantee at the time. And so we were able to offer a really robust voucher system for our participants and um, set up a recovery coach training throughout the state. And so because of the infrastructure funding that we were able to secure through the block grants, and some of the supplemental grant funding from some of the other areas, you know, we didn't have necessarily the same sort of struggles that other brand new kind of right out of the, right out of the gate RCOs have to deal with, with, you know, how are we gonna institute a, a Medicaid billing system? Do we contract with a, a biller? Do we hire a bookkeeper? You know, what type of staff do we need on the administrative side? Not just the peer recovery support service specialists and recovery coaches, but, you know, what kind of infrastructure do we need to build to lift up this high quality recovery support service structure? Also, I am just completely geeking out about the new tax that is out there right now, the digital recovery support services, and then also the infrastructure supports that are on the back end of that and the data that's being collected are very, very exciting to me. So I think that particular one stuck out to me, uh, along with, of course, you know, low reimbursement rates for fee for service is is still incredibly um, just really disappointing and disheartening. So I think those two for me really stuck out, and I'll let my my brilliant colleagues here uh, cover the other ones that that were some of my favorites. Go ahead, Sierra. 
Um, I totally agree with Kristen on the infrastructure piece. Um, so in addition to research, I've also worked in direct services as a collegiate recovery program director, then served on the board of an RCO in Austin, Texas. And then I've done evaluation consulting work for some RCOs. And so I also have seen that, you know, getting and managing grants, collecting data, not even for research purposes, but just to comply with funder evaluation requirements, um, that, that can be really tough. Um, so I agree that infrastructure and capacity building is, is something that would be really helpful. Um, and of course, I have a real soft spot for all of the economic evaluation uh, related uh, recommendations in that part. Um, but, but for me, what really stood out was the unified federal agency guidance. Um, it's really complicated to do economic evaluations in the U.S. in general because we have a, a pretty disjointed healthcare system. Um, but especially when reimbursement for services is so different by state, um, whether a service is even reimbursable, varying state by state. Um, and so that unified guidance might help us get on the same page a little bit better. Um, it would also um, it would also potentially help uh, efforts to centralize information about how people are using services and what those services cost. And that will really enable a lot more of this kind of economic evaluation work that does help make the case for further funding of these programs, further adoption of these programs, um, and really just making sure that they're reaching as many people as possible. Thank you. And uh, Liz, we'll give you the last word before we we answer the audience's question. Super, and I agree with everything that Kristen and, and Sierra said about building equitable capacity. So I will focus on yet other things. There were some um, recommendations for changes in CMS guidance that, that caught my eye. Um, this notion of state authorization of in lieu of services or I, ILOS, I think could be a game changer in that if states were to allow um, the provision of PRSS to address health-related social needs uh, without necessarily or preceding a diagnosis or in other ways, I think that would be a game changer in many respects for peer recovery support service organizations, especially those that are outside, again, of health care settings. Um, there was also suggestions in there around supervision and being able to deploy peer recovery supports and services flexibly. All of those, I think, go to um, being able to engage peer-run organizations, recovery community organizations, and other community-based organizations in a way that really um, sets uh, peer support services free. Um, I think the, the continuing to strive, as, as you said, Greg, in the lead into this question, for innovative payment models and doing uh, pilots and demonstrations of those with community partners um, is uh, an important um, recommendation in there as well. Um, and uh, one that's implied between the lines, but I'll say is not directly listed, but I'm going to sneak in here, is expanded support for diverse peer-run organizations and peer recovery community organizations. I think it's implied in what some of what Kristen said and, and, and Sierra, but the diverse workforce is a good starting point, but it's not enough. We know that the innovations for these peer supports and services are always, well, are frequently, majority wise, probably going to come out of peer run and recovery community organizations, we need to ensure that those are environments that can thrive um, so that uh, peer support can thrive in other settings. So um, I think expanded support for those uh, peer incubation settings are going to be important as well. Well, thank you. Thank you all. I'll uh, invite Elian Rosenfeld to, to join us and help uh, help us uh, moderate some, some of the questions that, that came in throughout. Well, thank you so much. Just to introduce myself, I'm Eliane Rosenfeld. I'm a senior director at WestEt and I work on um, the CFRI projects. So just first things for Sierra, we had a lot of questions about that calculator and I think you put it in the chat, but if you wanna give a little bit more information about how people can utilize it, that would be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. So I just put the link in the chat again um, and um, Jason Howell, who's on the webinar right now, um, he provided a link as well. If you don't mind popping that in there again, thank you. Um, we'll be doing a webinar that's a little bit more in depth on how to actually use it and interpret it. Um, so that is that analysis that I mentioned where we're comparing long-term PRSS 
to specialty substance use disorder treatment. So that's inpatient and outpatient um, and you know, showing the cost effectiveness of it in comparison to kind of the best case scenario for what people are getting right now, right? Um, and unsurprisingly, I think um, it's very cost effective and has um, tremendous benefits over treatment alone. Um, you can plug in your own numbers for your own program, including, you know, it, it'll be a tailored result um, specific to what you put in. Um, that webinar will include, uh, you know, walking through um, how to kind of estimate some of those numbers from whatever information you're already collecting. Um, you can also just use the default numbers. Um, and then uh, there's also a recorded webinar on that website already that you can watch if you can't make it for that live session. Thank you so much. That sounds like so one and Liz touched on this a little bit is what with CMS really moving towards value based payment models. What role or what way do you see how this could improve and index things for PRSS? And we'll open that to and or whoever else wants to. Sure. Um, so uh, we had a little bit of an internet uh, glitch there, but um, uh, you know, I, I heard the value-based uh, payment question around CMS and, and the ways that 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 could work. And I think um, I'll, I'll I'll kick it to Liz in a second. I, I'll just say that in the research for the report, um, historically, when we 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 innovated these services you know, from the federal government, they were given grants, states were given grants or individual organizations were given grants and they were given a set budget. And it wasn't, you know, serve 500 people or serve, you know, serve your community and 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 let's track and see how it goes. And, and so people would hire peers and they'd meet the needs of their community um, in a really flexible way that um, didn't, you know, necessarily have to be to an eligible beneficiary or what have you. And so there's some really amazing uh, benefits to that kind of financing structure um, where Medicaid doesn't operate that way. Medicaid operates for eligible beneficiaries. The, the, the upside is it's not capitated. So the, so the funding, if there's more need, you can get more resources to serve more people who are eligible. Uh, therein lies the challenge um, in that, that uh, the eligibility piece, but also the mechanics of Medicaid. And, and so that's, uh, I don't know, Liz, if you want to say more about um, innovations around payment that, that you could think of. That, that Yeah. And I mean, I think some innovations that are kind of, are beginning to be embedded are things like the certified community behavioral health centers. And we just have had some regional meetings with SAMHSA with some CCBHC grantees around how bundled payment is working um, for them um, might be um, an example. Uh, others uh, may have other thoughts about um, other value-based payment. I think the challenge in any of these innovative payment structures is really starting to think of peer recovery uh, support and services parallel to a preventive service. It's not exactly a preventive service, but we found a way to pay for um, in other health realms, a service that is pre-diagnosis, if you will, or in lieu of diagnosis. And we really need to be finding ways of doing that within this kind of uh, uh, Medicaid or other um, you know, um, innovative payment structures because of the value of peer supports before, during, after, or in lieu of treatment. Um, there was a question in the chat about the longevity of peer support and that being uh, more than an episodic, it's a relational kind of support and therefore uh, any funding mechanism really needs to, to fully support the genuineness of peer support needs to be able to account for that fluidity and that flexibility. And um, we're just about out of time, but Kristen, I'd love to to just have you uh, let the audience know about any um, other resources or things that there's been a lot of questions about a lot of state specific stuff or 
uh, you know, specific um, modalities and, and what have you. And some of those we, we can't get to for 500 people, you know, in this format, but but I'm sure you you can think of ideas or ways for them to get their questions answered. So I'll I'll leave you with the uh, the, the last word and navigating people to, to some answer some questions we didn't get to. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So for technical assistance and training needs for either substance use or mental health, peer recovery support services, I put a couple of links in the chat. Um, there's a couple just off the top of my head, the Peer Center of Excellence. They do a phenomenal job managing um, training and technical assistance needs. The Opioid Response Network, I actually did not put that in the chat, but that is also a really helpful network as well. And then we just launched, launched the SAMHSA Program to Advance Recovery Knowledge, or SPARC, and that chat, uh, that is also in the chat, and that one has a uh, very specific equity, diversity, inclusion, accessibility focus. Um, and then the Copeland Center for Stores to Wellbeing is another one. I think last inventory I did for training and technical assistance uh, that SAMHSA funds right now, there's 14, uh, both in mental health and substance use um, TA support. So uh, check out our website and you'll be able to, to see whatever the specific needs that you may have, hopefully you'll be able to find uh, what you're looking for. Well, thank you so much, Kristen, Sierra, and Liz for, for joining us and spending your time. Uh, appreciate everybody who, who helped contribute to this report. And I will uh, turn it back to Shoma for some closing yes. remarks. Thank you. And um, I echo everything Greg said. Thank you, everybody. There's been lots of things in the chat in terms of URLs. What we will do is we will put those on the slides that we circulate to everybody. We'll, it'll be on the last page of the slides, all of the URLs. I would like to iterate, just remind everybody that the recording for this and the slides uh, will be on the samsa.gov forward slash CFRI website. And um, the report is already out there. So thank you all again for joining us. We so appreciate you taking the time on, out of your busy day to be with us today. Thank you and goodbye.